Well, hello, and uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is David Skinner. I work at NERSC, which is a uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab Office of Science Supercomputing Center. Um, uh, we're located down in Oakland, and I'll be talking about uh, performance debugging. I, looking through the agenda, there have been a lot of talks about debugging and making programs run um, and run correctly. My talk is about making them run fast, um, and this is largely within the context of uh, scientific computing through large-scale parallelism uh, on machines such as Hopper is one that I'll be uh, addressing, which is 150,000 cores uh, at your disposal for scientific computing at, at NERSC. Um, and uh, I would just keep in mind the kind of caveat that um, the perspective that I'm bringing is sort of from the MPI, OpenMP, large-scale parallelism world. Uh, I recognize there are lots of ways to make programs run fast, and this is really about the HPC side. So overview of the talk is um, I'll be telling you a little bit about uh, practice, where to find the tools, some specifics about how to run these things at NERSC, specifically in Hopper, um, some principles, overall kind of guiding principles, a little bit of advice about uh, performance of parallel codes, uh, both performance and scalability. Some examples of areas where tools can help, some caveats to watch out for, and uh, really in terms of scope and audience, I've worked a lot with the CS267 crowd, which I understand you know, some of the boot camp attendees are participants with that, which are um, you know, a variety of folks, but um, in part uh, people who are embarking on writing a parallel code themselves to, to drive their, their research agenda. Um, if you're writing a compiler or middleware, <coughs> Uh, or an operating system or something like that, uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, this is really about um, making uh, applications run fast. For people who are unfamiliar, I included one slide, which is a summary of NERSC. Um, we serve all the uh, Department of Energy Office of Science program offices, which is a breadth of science that looks approximately like a university. There's geophysics to climate to quantum mechanics and all kinds of stuff. Um, we're, as the name implies, all about sustained performance in science, so benchmarks are important to us, but they're not as important as making things run fast all year long for as many people as possible, which in our case is, is a lot of people. We have uh, 4,000 active users, about 500 logged in in a day, and those 4,000 are in about 300 different projects. Um, so we're, we're all about scalability in terms of dealing with lots of uh, projects at the same time. And uh, we make some architectural decisions that are based on some of the performance uh, criteria and thoughts that are in this talk. So I wanted to, before diving into the particulars, offer some kind of big picture ideas about performance and scalability. Um, one is that performance is, is way more than a single number. It's a, uh, I, I would encourage you to take a big picture view of performance and to look at the, the overall process uh, about what it means to, to go fast. Um, and this is one which is common to um, a, a process, a workflow that you would see at NERSC is that there's a, a research problem which drives either coding or, the, or finding a code that, that can do that, um, debugging the code, then doing performance debugging, running lots of jobs, probably lots of jobs, uh, if you're lucky if you run a small number of jobs, waiting in a queue, dealing with some data maybe, then doing uncertainty quantification and verification and validation that is figuring out that you got the right answer and then going uh, forward with your, your academic uh, agenda. So this is a cartoon uh, of, of that process. If you're dealing with instruments or sensors, you may have a data issue before you even get started. Um, and, uh, uh, but this is, this is a fairly common sort of uh, thread through an HPC center like NERSC. Today I'll be talking about um, really these, these areas right here in the middle, which are doing performance debugging. The code is already uh, running correctly dealing with jobs and, uh, and optimization and how to deal with a batch queue. So I would encourage you to you know, plan where to put effort. You don't always know beforehand, but if you, if you can plan, that's good. I made the mistake as a grad student at, at Berkeley taking a code and thinking that if I parallelized everything in it, then it would go fast. And uh, that's, that's really not the case. There is this Omdahl's Law thing out there to pay attention to, and the, the bottlenecks that are important in addressing are the bottlenecks that um, that are first order. Um, another sort of caveat is that optimization in one area can de-optimize another area of that. And I can point out many different examples across here, but you know how you how you code something certainly determines how you can debug it. 
Um, if you put in lots of debug uh, code, that may change how the performance characteristics are. Um, how you run your jobs can, as we'll talk about, determine how quickly you run through the batch queue and, and lots of other aspects like that. So paying attention to the first order bottlenecks is, is, uh, is good advice. Um, performance is both measured you know, in terms of code execution, but also how you're spending your time dealing with code and how, um, how easy that is to deal with. And um, whereas you know, finding the fastest algorithm out there may, uh, you know, is, is in general worth looking at, sometimes a slower, stupider algorithm can provide more concrete results which you'll spend less time uh, you know, trying to determine whether or not you've got the right answer for the right reason. A couple other kind of high-level uh, philosophical statements. One is that, you know, that performance is relative. Uh, it's, it's not one number. It's relative to, to your goals, to your research agenda. Um, I'll use this term here, allocation. Uh, that's because I work at a center which is allocated, that you have one million hours to use. And if you have research that you want to get done in that one million hours, then um, making efficient use of that one million hours is an important target. So. In that case, uh, you know, if you can wait longer in the queue and not run in a priority queue, you know, that's, an, a, that's a great way to optimize your use of that allocation. If you're lucky enough to exist in an environment where you don't have an allocation, you have a, a bottomless pit of cycles to, to draw on, then that's great, um, but it uh, won't always be the case. Performance is definitely relative to the, uh, the application code itself, the input deck, and the machine type and state. So there's no such thing as uh, a high performance code. I think um, there, there are such things as low performance codes, but in order for a code to perform well, it really depends on the architecture that it's run on, the code itself, and the input deck. And uh, you, you can, as we'll show in uh, some examples, subtly change one of those things and end up in a very, very different performance scenario. Sorry to mention this. Focus on the first order bottlenecks um, as opposed to making everything perform well. So I don't mean to make performance seem like a totally nebulous philosophical thing. There are certain very concrete aspects of making codes run fast that are, um, that are, are expressible. Um, leveraging all the instruction level parallelism you can on the processor is generally good. Um, you know, if you have multiple floating point units, if you have SIMD instructions that you can use, um, by all means use them. Pay attention to the pipelines, particularly in the, in the uh, Memory subsystem nowadays is on uh, multi-core systems increasingly a place for contention. Uh, exploit data locality wherever possible. That's been mentioned in some of the previous talks. And uh, pay attention to cache boundaries and that sort of thing. So that's, that's all you know, concrete performance advice within a node. Um, between nodes and uh, in a parallel sense, try to expose concurrency wherever possible. Uh, minimize latency effects and spend all the time you can actually working as opposed to pushing messages uh, from place to place. Performance is, I think this is the last bit of general advice, um, is hierarchical. Um, you know, the, 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 the objects which uh, are constraints and tools towards uh, performance vary depending on where you are in the computer architecture from registers to caches to local memory to remote memory to disk and file system. A lot of those um, specific facets to performance, both in serial and parallel sense, generalize across this whole hierarchy of where your code is running. So if you can, keeping, uh, keeping um, information in registers and caches as close as possible is good. And the way I talk about that in CS267 is to think globally and compute locally. Okay, so on to more specific aspects of uh, HPC tools. And I should mention, if you have questions, feel free to, to pipe up at any time. I have. Um, way more uh, examples than I can go into, and one of them might fit, the, uh, fit your question. So these are specifics about HPC tools that you'll find uh, at NERSC, but they're fairly general. The uh, computing world is, from an architectural perspective, relatively flat these days. You know, that uh, you'll find uh, Cray XE systems like Hopper or uh, IBM Blue Gene systems and things like that, but um, in terms of large-scale parallelism, it's not as, as varied as it was in the, say, the vector days. So I mentioned that performance is, is hierarchical. Uh, tools are hierarchical as well. And um, I've called out some names of tools here, getting into specifics of uh, 
performance uh, related tools that, that apply to these different levels. And um, the, the, you know, the, there are tools that sort of aggregate the information from these lower levels into higher level reports and all that sort of thing. But the fact that, that uh, performance and tools are hierarchical in this way uh, is, is important because if you know that your problem is with cache misses, um, you know, you may not need a, a, a big GUI tool that takes the, the whole application in and reports everything that you need to know about it. If you can use a lighter weight tool, like say Pappy in this case, just to get the cache miss misses out, then you can turn around your development time and your performance debug time by focusing on the, the element of the hierarchy which is, which is of concern. So how do tools work? How do they get inside your code? Um, they, they uh, you know, through relinking or uh, dynamic libraries or other things get inside and they do typically um, one of, of two things is uh, they'll either sample, which is that they'll wake up periodically and, uh, and read some information, some performance information and build up a statistical profile. So those are typically based on interrupts which mean that a certain number of cycles go by and then it wakes up and um, assuming that there's no uh, magic uh, relationship between the number of cycles and where you are in the code, then you end up with a statistical, uh, you know, examination across the entire, uh, uh, across the entire code as opposed to profiling one routine more than another. Um, now, a couple things about that. One, it's statistical and statistics come with, uh, you know, some responsibilities about how long do you run the code before you conclude that this uh, statistical profile is, is actually accurate. Another is that if you if you have a bulk synchronous parallel code, um, which is say running on 40,000 cores, and each process on each of those 40,000 cores is periodically waking up and doing something, the actual parallel performance that you could see could be very, very different, which is the, the jitter and uh, asynchrony, uh, which is introduced by the, those kind of randomly uh, fired interrupts can significantly change the performance of the code. Uh, another methodology is uh, tracing. Uh, so you put hooks into the program and record every uh, event that happens. So likewise, there's a caveat here about if you run on 40,000 cores for 12 hours, you may end up with many, many function calls that happen during that time. And finding a place to store that data, storing it in a way that um, doesn't, again, impact the conclusions that you would make about the performance of the code is important. Um, Tools often also use hardware event counters, which are special registers uh, that tell you flop rate, cache hits, uh, cache misses, uh, translation look aside buffer uh, misses, all that sort of thing. Um, and uh, that, that's uh, very nice because in, unless you're sort of a intensely interested in the inner workings of a chip, um, having a tool that can read and interpret those events for you is quite nice because they're not implemented uniformly across architectures at all. So what will a tool ask you to do? Um, sometimes, many times, uh, it may ask you to modify your code to call out the sections that are, uh, that are relevant, that are important. Um, it may uh, you know, require you to recompile your code. We have some examples that don't require that as well. Um, it may require to actually, you know, in some cases, uh, translate your binary into a different type of binary and run that through a simulator or some other sort of controlled environment. Um, so, uh, and you know, at, at the end it may require a, another tool to sort of interpret the results from the runtime tool. Um, so this goes into what I was saying about the taking a big, uh, big sort of view of performance overall, which is that if, it's, if you have a simple performance uh, debug that you want to, performance debug scenario that you want to run through, you know, if it's asking you to, if a tool is asking you to transform your binary in a large way, amortize that effort into the larger uh, view of, of how, how fast you're making things. Some, some of the performance tools that we have at NERSC are uh, Craypat. There's also a tool that I, I won't talk about today called Apprentice, um, which is a kind of higher level tool above Craypat. Um, there are community tools uh, such as uh, Tracing and Analysis Utilities, Tau from University of Oregon. The uh, performance uh, API, uh, uh, Pappy, Gprof, which is you'll find on any sort of Unix or Linux uh, machine. And uh, another tool that I'll talk about today is one that was developed at NERSC called Integrated Performance Monitoring. Uh, 
So that's some of the spectrum of tools that are out there. What can you expect a tool to, to inform you of? Um, certainly flop rate was, is one that goes back a long way. And uh, when I was uh, admonishing you to uh, you know, consider performance to be more than one number, certainly flop rate is not a metric of success in writing a code. Um, you can write a, a dense uh, linear algebra solver that is you know, incapable of solving the sort of problems that a sparse solver can solve, but it'll probably, you know, if you write it reasonably, have a tremendously higher flop rate. So achieving a, a high flop rate is not a measure of um, really making something run fast. Um, likewise, memory is, uh, is an important thing. If you run out of memory, your program's probably gonna just stop. <coughs> um, knowing what the memory high, high watermark of a run is is useful so that you can make sure that you don't step above that. Memory usage fluctuates over the course of, of a run, and so uh, of the course of, of, of execution, so it's important to keep in mind that the instantaneous memory in use may not be available to you at any time, but kind of understanding over the course of a, a long period of a run, how much memory am I using? A tool can, um, certainly OpenMP on multi-core systems is more uh, popular these days. When, when one uses OpenMP, you can have both a, a speed up in the fact that you're, you're you know, having benefit from uh, the usage of more threads, but there's some overhead. And so unless you're able to explicitly measure the overhead, all you see is the sum, uh, sort of the, you know, the, di the difference between those. And uh, having an explicit um, measurement of the OpenMP overhead is useful because then you can see how much of the performance that you would have gotten was sort of stolen from you by the OpenMP implementation and uh, how much more remains to be had. Finding the, the right number of threads to run is important. Um, one uh, performance technique that is increasingly <coughs> popular is, is idling cores. So not, not using all the cores on a multi-core socket. Um, this you know, may seem like a waste in some ways, and it certainly is if you can make use of all the cores, but if you are, for instance, limited by memory bandwidth or some other resource, then the idea of, of idling you know, some proportion of the other cores in order to increase performance is, is, a, is a reasonable one. MPI has been, in, uh, been with us in HPC for a long time, and um, there are some uh, very simple performance scenarios that can be detected and improved upon with MPI. Certainly trying to decrease the amount of wall time that's spent doing explicit communication, trying to maximize the amount of time that's spent with overlapped communication and computation, and uh, detecting or avoiding load imbalance is an important uh, uh, aspect of MPI performance, as well as analyzing message sizes. So uh, the, I have some examples in a little bit of the, the last two. Load imbalance is one of these things that um, a lot of people who write codes think, um, I wrote the code in a way that the domain decomposition is uniform, therefore I'm not gonna experience load imbalance. I would encourage you really to check. Um, there are lots and lots of things, architectural, algorithmic, um, that, uh, or even based on the input, um, that can induce load imbalance. And um, as somebody who works at a computing center where we have a lot of large codes running, you know, uh, the, the unfortunate thing about load imbalance is it just takes one slow thread or one slow core in order to slow down the other, you know, 50, 60,000 threads that are there. And so, whereas, you know, in a, in a very principled sense, you might think I did everything in a load balanced way definitely go check because if one thread is slowing down the other 599,099 uh, cores, then uh, that's pretty unfortunate overall. So I've described a little bit of the, the spectrum of tools that are out there. Um, which tool should you use? Well, um, that's view, I would view it kind of like a toolbox, you know, that there are lots, lots out there and you can kind of uh, look for the right one to use starting with a simple tool and then moving towards a more complicated one is a generally advisable approach. Because there will be overhead in terms of learning the tool, um, uh, implementing the tool, uh, the overhead that the tool has on your, uh, your application itself. Um, so some of the scenarios that are common um, at NERSC are debugging a code that's slow, that is that it's so slow that it's, it's noticeably uh, under where it should be. Um, doing more detailed performance debugging, which is that you're about to commit using your 15 million hours of allocation and you wanna make sure that 
you're getting the most bang for the buck that you can out of that, uh, that allocation. And then uh, what I call performance monitoring in production, which is that then doing performance monitoring as you are uh, sort of expending your allocation, as you're using that up to, as a kind of dashboard to see where the time is going, where the performance is going. Because if, um, to use one example that, that happened earlier this year, there was a software change which changed the performance, uh, a system, <coughs> system level software change, pardon me, <coughs> that changed the performance of a code that, that was on a two month sort of uh, path of executing their code. They wouldn't have known that unless they had a, a barometer of some sort about where the performance was going. So di let's dive into one of the first ones, which is Craypat. Um, Craypat is, is a, a well-documented set of tools. Here are the information on the man pages down there. It can do a, a lot of different things. It can do um, uh, sampling, it can do tracing, it can do uh, profiling. Um, I'll, this example that I'll give is about uh, basic profiling in the code. Um, lots of languages and uh, communication libraries are supported by Cray through this tool. And uh, you can really get, um, get a lot of the performance scenarios that we were discussing earlier. So this is a sort of five-step uh, view of, of how to use uh, Craypat on a, a code at Hopper is that you do module load perf tools, go ahead and then remake your code. Um, you're going to end up with a bunch of uh, object files then. And what this command pat build does is it rebuilds another executable using the, all those object files but inserting a lot of instrumentation into basically every function and uh, every library call that's run. Then this uh, AP run, which is uh, like MPI run, if you've not used a Cray before, you re-execute the code and then um, you, you end up with a uh, uh, XF file, which is the performance data that emitted. This is analogous to a, uh, oh, like a gmon.out, if you're familiar with gprof and that, that sort of tool. Then you can do pat report on that, and then you can generate a profile. What does a profile look like? It'll be a report that has a lot of information about uh, computational intensity, the L1 hit ratio, uh, L2 information, all these things. These are the sort of <coughs> guidelines, uh, again, suggested by Cray for what should, you, what should you expect to achieve. And I would encourage you to interpret that broadly because if you're running Linpack, um, you'll see a very different sort of performance uh, profile than, than, if you're, uh, than if you're running an adaptive mesh refinement code or, or something like that. But these are some, some general uh, notions that you should be getting at least half of the uh, possible instructions that you can get uh, in a clock cycle. Computational intensity is you know, the number of operations uh, per, uh, per clock cycle. The uh, L1 hit ratio uh, should be, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that should be greater than 90%. And uh, so these are some guidelines absent any other sort of metric about the performance of the code that, that inform you about um, are you getting the most out of the machine or not. So then moving on to talk about uh, doing uh, performance tools in production, this idea of recompiling your code, generating a large data file, and then running a tool on it is, is rather heavyweight if what you really want to do is run a thousand batch jobs and kind of understand the performance that's coming out of them as they go. And so this integrated performance monitoring approach is one that, um, that we've developed at, at NERSC that, that kind of fills that tool's niche uh, overall. And it gives information about MPI, hardware, perform uh, hardware counter metrics, and POSIX I.O. profiling. Increasingly, uh, kind of data-centric issues and, uh, and I.O. Are, are things that are a much, much larger fraction of the performance discussions than they had been in the past, where, you know, for a long time, people were mainly concerned about the percentage of vectorization that they got out of the code or the amount of communication time. It seems like this uh, POSIX I.O. area is one that's really grown uh, quite considerably in terms of causing people headaches. So IPM is a, is a lighter weight tool, more sort of a flip of a switch. You just do module load and then you run as you normally would. Um, if it's a static executable, you do need to just do a simple relink. Um, and then what IPM does is it generates a performance profile in the form of an inventory, which is 
lighter weight than a trace or, or sampling of all the function calls that were made, the total time spent in them, the number of times, the minimum time, the maximum time, that sort of information. So here's an example. If you do module load IPM and then, uh, you know, you'll, in your standard out, you'll get this banner that has uh, the command that was run, uh, when it was run, uh, where it was run, how much wall clock time was spent, uh, that it was how many tasks and how many nodes, uh, the percentage of communication time, the gigaflop rate, because everybody wants to know the gigaflop rate, and the, uh, the aggregate memory uh, in use. So if you're, if you're adjusting knobs in either the input or the code or other sort of things, that, that banner alone is oftentimes enough to decide whether or not the change that you've made to the code is, is a step up or is a step down or you're headed in the right direction or the wrong direction. And it provides for a very fast uh, turnaround in terms of getting performance information back to, um, back to the, the person submitting the, the, the runs or modifying the code. So when we say uh, doing performance analysis in production, that's what we mean is that it's very lightweight, done through the batch queue, and, um, and you're able to, to get lots of results back quickly. I won't read through all this certainly, but there is a, a more detailed option that if you want to get more information about, um, you know, different timings in the system, uh, hardware performance counters, uh, communication statistics, that, those sorts of things that will um, allow a, a more refined view of, uh, of the execution. So again, in, in um, choosing tools, the, there is a trade-off between the, the two tools that I've talked about so far. One is uh, very in-depth information from Craypat, which is a vendor-specific tool. Um, but if you want to, for instance, decide should I run on machine A or machine B, um, it can be very hard to make um, apples to apples comparisons when the tool that you use on one machine is different than the tool on another. So if you, um, one of the big advantages of some of the community uh, tools is that they're portable. You can get the same sort of profile from one architecture uh, compared to another. And, um, and then really make direct comparisons about, uh, about your scaling studies. Likewise, a lot of people in the tools community uh, uh, vilify printf as a, uh, as a performance tool. You know, I would say you can certainly overdo it. If you do printf from every core um, on a very large parallel code, you'll be swamped with data. But um, if you put some timers in your code and, um, and then, you know, do the right operations to, to make a simple report, you can build your own uh, performance tool by which to, uh, to check the more detailed ones. So here's some more concrete examples of uh, how tools are used at, at NERSC in, uh, to make things run fast. Almost every uh, time that we're asked to, to work on uh, making codes go fast, we, we think about doing a scaling study. And um, a scaling study is basically just varying the concurrency, the amount of parallelism that's brought to solve the computational problem uh, to see how, how successful that is. <coughs> and there are two, way, two ways of doing that. One is a strong scaling study and the other is weak, weak. So in a strong scaling study, you fix the, the problem to be solved as a, a given size and then you're allowed to adjust the number of cores or threads or nodes or whatever that are brought to, to, uh, to tackle that problem. In a weak scaling study, the problem grows as the, as the concurrency grows. And so, um, you know, you could think of uh, a weak scaling study as one in which um, you haven't yet gotten to the actual problem that you want to solve. So you're, you're growing it as the, uh, as the problem, uh, as you're allowed more memory or, or CPUs or threads. And the, uh, we talked about the, the speed up, which is the, uh, the serial time divided by the parallel time. And in making things go fast at scale, what we want to see is to see the speed up um, increase linearly with n. So I if at all possible, we can sort of use every core as well as we use the, the previous one uh, in order to, to decrease the wall clock time. That's a uh, uh, wonderful goal. Um, and the efficiency is basically how well are we using those. Um, just with the caveat that some people define these differently. Um, for instance, in some cases, particularly for a strong scaling problem, you may not be able to run it as a serial problem. You know, if, if the problem involves, uh, you know, a uh, 3 million by 3 million matrix and you can't fit that into a single core, then there's no way to do the serial problem for comparison. Okay, so here's a simple example of what a scaling study looks like. <coughs> 
Um, in this case, the problem to be solved is um, how large a 3D, uh, you know, end of the cubed FFT can I efficiently run on 1024 CPUs? And in this case, it happens to be a complex uh, uh, FFT. And uh, this is a, a weak scaling study, as, uh, as the, the sort of points out, is that, you know, N is allowed to, uh, to freely float as there's more memory and more cores available as we go up. And uh, this is the mega flop rate uh, versus the number of cores, so starting from 100 cores out to 1,000 cores. One might say, well, this looks pretty good. It's, it's uh, you know, certainly going up as, uh, the, as the, mega, the mega flop rate is going up as the concurrency is going up. Well, I typically advise people to look at scaling studies a little more closely than that because a lot can be uh, can be misleading about that. So this is same same sort of study but with a lot more data um, that's done here. And there's maybe a little more data than is reasonable to put on the chart, but you don't need to necessarily focus on this down here. So this is, again, mega flop rate and concurrency, uh, 100 cores, 1,000 cores. <coughs> and you can see that for 1024 cores, which this is the question we set out to answer, which is, you know, how large an FFT, you know, can I efficiently do on 1024 cores? Um, you know, the performance is anything but smooth as a function of concurrency. And um, there, you know, I, sometimes in CS267, I, I ask people if they want to guess why this is, but um, I don't know. Anybody want to guess? Okay. So in a... In FFT, the, the algorithm that's used, the, the, the performance, really depends on the prime factorization of the dimensionality of the problem that you're solving. So doing a, an FFT on a, a, a power of two sized uh, data object is, can be done much more efficiently than one that is, say, a prime number or something like that. So this is an example where the scaling study can miss quite a bit in terms of the variance of the performance metric on the on the, the weak scaling parameter n, the size of the problem. And in fact, once you go to a 1025 sized matrix, the performance drops uh, tremendously. Right? And so these sorts of uh, performance scenarios are uh, not always as, as complex as this. And ho hopefully, you know, if you're doing a particle in cell or, or sort of meshed type of uh, computation, you won't see this dramatic sort of variation. But if you do a scaling study that just has two points on it, you're either, you know, very, very in touch with the algorithmic complexity within your code, or you're just taking a shot in the dark. And that, that shot in the dark is described right here by this green line, so. Um, so I mentioned algorithm, al algorithmic complexity. Um, the, uh, the communication uh, protocols, say, within MPI, they can switch gears on you, much in the same way as that a manual uh, automatic transmission in a car can, right, is that they have to make decisions about buffer sizes and communication times and queue depths and things like that. So the, uh, when the communication protocol decides to make a switch, it won't necessarily, in many cases, won't inform you of that, and you can see the performance change pretty quickly. So all the more reason to have the performance monitored in the context in which you're actually doing the runs and doing uh, kind of production performance monitoring. You may be getting clobbered by uh, another job that's running on the, on the system if, they're, if you're fighting over the switch. Um, that's, uh, that's certainly been seen and, uh, you know, you may have also encountered bugs in, in vendor software. So I wanted to contrast that with an example uh, that I hope you see instead of that in your, uh, in your study. So this is a uh, simple Jacobi done with uh, OpenMP. Um, this is the number of threads down here, and this is the runtime. And so what we see is the runtime uh, falling, you know, uh, optimally as we add more threads. And so um, in, in this, and the two things that are here, the most important one is the uh, OpenMP communication, uh, computation, this is the wall clock time. <coughs> This is the overhead, um, which is orders of magnitude below, you know, the, the, uh, the overall uh, computational time, which is good. This is what I was mentioning before about OpenMP, is if you can measure the overhead, you can see how much of the potential speed up that you could have gotten is being taken by the OpenMP implementation. So uh, straight lines in scaling studies, at least on a log plot, are always a good thing. Um, and the structure that you see outside that is typically an indication of some other uh, algorithmic or architectural wrinkle coming into the picture. Any questions about that? <coughs> 
Um, I could go on for a long time about load imbalance, but I won't. I, I already had uh, sort of a caveat about that earlier, is that um, the, the most well thought out domain decomposition schemes can fall victim to changes in input to the code, changes in concurrency, <coughs> running on a different machine that has a different um, core to, to node uh, layout or, or uh, multiplicity. And this is, this is how you lose, you know, a tremendous amount of performance to, to load imbalance is that some proportion, uh, in this case, some uh, small number of tasks, some 64 tasks here, um, spend less time in MPI all to all. And uh, as a result, you know, many of the, the remaining 960 tasks uh, spend 30 extra seconds in MPI all to all. So, uh, you know, the, the most fallacious way to think about this is that these, these tasks are really good at MPI all to all, so they, uh, they take less time doing it. In fact, they're probably, you know, doing other, more things other than MPI all to all, spend that extra 30 seconds doing that, and then pass that cost on to, to all the others. Because MPI all to all is a, uh, is a uh, synchronizing MPI collector, so nobody leaves that call until everybody's arrived, and so if there are stragglers to the MPI all to all call, then everybody pays the price. Um, so it's useful to know which of your MPI calls are synchronizing and which aren't. If you can substitute a, uh, an asynchronous call for a synchronous one, uh, go for it. Um, you can sometimes seamlessly deal with load imbalance in that way. Um, much in the same way that a, uh, a scaling study that on a log plot is a straight line is ideal, looking at um, thread or, um, or MPI rank index and, and any sort of performance metric on the y-axis, you probably want to have that flat. There are some rare exceptions to that, but these sorts of discontinuities like you see right here are representative <coughs> structure of load imbalance or some other thing gone wrong in the code. And uh, I don't think I included the slides in this talk, but it's, it can be useful to go through and then say, well, what's different about these 64 tasks compared to the others? And, you know, we see all sorts of things that can be that the domain decomposition is uh, kind of numerologically off a little bit, so it's it's uh, the way it's dividing up the work is is slightly off, and uh, some of the tasks get more than others. Uh, sometimes it's boundary conditions that that will get you that the uh, the node that sits on a face, an edge, or a corner of a of a grid or a mesh has to do extra checking or checking in a in an indirect way with a different index, and so it's uh, it's unlike the others, and that introduces a, uh, a performance pitfall. Result, this is a slide about resol resolving that. So this is a, a four-task cartoon of the previous example. Um, here done chronologically, where we imagine this is time going along. And I've drawn up here what I'll call the universal HPC application, which is uh, something that has a synchronizing event, <coughs> And does some computation, the green part, which is flops, and then does some I.O. And that I.O. could be disk I.O., it could be communication, it could be pretty much whatever. So in this case, the amount of floating point work, the computational work that's distributed amongst the four tasks is different. And in, in some cases, maybe the, in this case, none of the I.O. is different, but uh, that is another possibility. So thus, the amount of time that's spent in the synchronizing call varies because no task can leave that call until everybody's caught up. And uh, so that is the, the source of the load imbalance, is these synchronizing events that happen there. And if we're able to regularize the amount of green computational floating point work across the tasks, then you can save approximately the yellow amount of time in, uh, in wall clock time. And again, that wall clock time is multiplied by the concurrency. So if you're running on uh, you know, 64,000 tasks, you know, we're talking about a, a potentially quite large uh, fraction of time. So the next most easiest uh, communication pitfall to arrive to is really uh, latency, uh, becoming latency bound. Um, this is the sharks and fish example from uh, CS267, which is a, a simple uh, particle mesh type of code um, uh, that involves predation of uh, uh, sharks on fish uh, and their, their populations varying. On the y-axis is the percentage of communication, and on the x-axis is the number of cores on hopper. Now, the, the three 
uh, sets of data are three sizes. This is with a, a thousand sharks, two thousand sharks, and ten thousand sharks. And you could, you know, set aside the notion of sharks and fish if you like, and just think of one thousand, two thousand, and ten thousand as being the overall size of the problem that's going in. So um, what you can see is that uh, for a, a problem size of a thousand, it's quite easy to drive the communication time up significantly, you know, on a small number of hundreds of, of cores. And, uh, you know, this is a pretty much universal across scientific computing codes, maybe not so in transaction processing, but in, in uh, most HPC codes, there will be communication that's part of the algorithm that's synchronous. And if you have to divide the communication up into smaller and smaller pieces, you'll end up with more, uh, more time just spent building the messages and sending them than actually doing the, the computation. So how can, you drive, how can you keep the communication time lower? Well, you can run at a smaller concurrency overall or if, if it's interesting to you and, and, uh, and uh, possible, you know, you can increase the, the problem size that you're looking at. And then on the same number of cores, you know, have a, a much, uh, per, much more preferable uh, performance situation. So I didn't make it clear, but lo lower is better on this graph. You want to have the least amount of communication time uh, possible that you can. I think the, the last uh, concrete example I have here is of uh, again, a, a kind of riddle that I give people in CS267, but I'll probably just give away here, which is that if you look at a uh, performance summary of um, uh, where is the time going into MPI, either in the, this pie chart here or is described as well here in tabular form, you can see that the, most of the communication time goes to MPI all reduce, which is um, in some sense reasonable. That's a very widely used uh, bulk uh, synchronous code in MPI. But the second fraction of time is going to MPI COM rank. Uh, and MPI COM rank just tells you which, which thread you are, which rank you are in MPI space. And it's being called uh, exorbitant number of times and you know, ends up consuming 6% of the wall clock time. So in, in this case, this is a, a uh, example from the wild. Um, all that was needed to do that was to embed a function that needed to ask what rank am I about three levels deep in a loop. Um, the question, what rank am I, could be answered once outside that and not called over and over again. And uh, what made it opaque is that this was being called kind of doubly inside a function rather than, uh, rather than explicitly. And, you know, unless you, unless you profile things and kind of look at where is the time going, I, everybody could say, well, there's no reason to have MPI com rank consume 6% of your wall clock time. Well, until you check, you know, you, you're, you're, not, you're know, probably not sure about it. The last, uh, so th those are the most of the kind of real world examples, particularly if you're starting off with a code um, to look for. This is a, a, a more, more uh, complex, uh, more rarely used performance analysis methodology, which is looking at uh, the, in these, all these diagrams, this is a kind of communication adjacency in the sense that <coughs> uh, this is MPI rank here and MPI rank here. There's a dot if that rank talks to the other rank uh, through MPI. And so uh, what we're checking here is that the, the communication topology faithfully represents the algorithm that's, that's being used. So for instance, if you have a, a 1D stencil, um, you should see something that's like this. Uh, everybody talks to their left neighbor and to their right neighbor. They don't talk to, to other ranks. Um, this is a uh, more poloidal sort of uh, spherical 2D model, uh, which again uh, maps onto what it should be. Um, this is a all-to-all -all, uh, FFT, uh, intensity functional theory. Again, that sort of maps out correctly. Um, this is a adaptive mesh refinement code that involves a lot of dynamic uh, reorganization of communication. So all these examples are legit in the sense that they're doing what they should. If you can get the communication topology from your code, which you can do with CrayPAT or you can do with IPM, and you see something which is dramatically different than what you would expect, that is that you, you see large blocks of tasks that are that are communicating with one another that don't need to be, um, then uh, this is one quick way to kind of uh, analyze that because you can see whether or not the, the communication algorithm is really represented by the communication measurement. Um, and in terms of which tasks are talking to other tasks, this is, I think, a, a 2D stencil that you can see that there's the, uh, the nearest neighbor uh, communication, then there's the, uh, the uh, stride one communication away from that. The last topic that I'll 
dive into here is uh, performance in the batch queue space. I started off by encouraging you to think broadly about what performance means, not just um, you know boosting the flop rate of a code. Um, so uh, there are, are a couple considerations about how to how to make a, a queue run efficiently in your favor. One is to consider your schedule. Um, most computing centers will at least have a regular and a low priority. Um, that, say at NERSC, the low priority is charged at half the rate that the regular one is. Right. Well, if you're uh, you know, uh, not uh, 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 procrastinating, and you and you have your your work that you're working on for CS two sixty seven in early, you can submit it to the queue. You know, a week ahead of time, get charged half the amount, and and move on. And uh, just the same. So, this is just simply an economization sort of thing. <coughs> Many computing centers have scavenger queues as well, where um, your job is not guaranteed to finish. Um, so if you can. Uh, sort of fit in the cracks in the queue in a, in a way, you know, where um, your code knows how to checkpoint restart often, and so you can use these smaller blocks of time that um, that other people aren't willing to use. That's a, a, a ideal way to do it. There are also transfer queues, which if you, um, they're called transfer queues oftentimes because people have data that they want to move at the end of their batch job. Um, but in, if, you, if you have a two-step workflow and you require concurrency n in the first step, let's say to do a big computation, and then you require concurrency one or five uh, in, in the second step, you can actually uh, do that through a transfer queue where you're not charged for all 10,000 cores to do the, the five core task at the end. Um, so you can downshift the concurrency as needed uh, uh, through the queue. Um, so these are all sort of uh, economizing factors that have to do with your schedule. If you want to accelerate things and move move forward more quickly, um, there, there are other constraints. Most uh, most time you'll only have a certain number of jobs you can run at, a, at one time. Uh, only a certain number of jobs that can be queued at, at a given time, and uh, a certain maximum wall clock length um, that uh, that you can't run beyond. Um, Oh, I left out a bullet here about hard checkpointing, but soft checkpointing is that most batch queues will send your application a soft signal that says, in, in five minutes, you need to be done. Um, and if you can write a signal handler that can that can accept that and say, okay, you know, I'll finish up and then and then move on, you can do a variety of things. You can um, you can just finish up to make sure that you don't get interrupted mid cycle in one of the uh, uh, mid iteration, you know, in your next iteration. Uh, you can also um, do something like submit another job. So if if one job that can't fit in the wall clock limit knows how to say, oh, I'm almost done, let's save state and then I'll fire off another job, then you can you know effectively run a, a job that would take a week to run and not have to log in in the middle of the night and see whether or not um, you know uh, your your job is uh, still has time or not. Um, that applies here as well too. So you know if if you have a two-step job, you can have one job submit the lower concurrency job uh, afterwards. Um, the uh, these other two I didn't really talk about run run limit and queue limit. Um, you know, if you're only allowed to have five batch jobs in the queue, and you're doing something that involves ten thousand jobs or whatever, um, you know, you can be really bottlenecked uh, around that sort of policy. And so, uh, what I'll call marshaling your own workflow, which is um, Carving out a section of the machine and then doing your own scheduling within that is uh, is well within your possibility. Uh, Hadoop, Condor, MySGE uh, are kind of infrastructural ways of doing that, where you can set up a you know a cluster or a resource that'll do that for you. Um, there is a lot of setup to or for Hadoop. I understand there's quite a bit of setup. MySGE there's not not as much. However, on a machine like Hopper, it's pretty easy. So this is a snippet, a representative snippet of a batch queue script, and uh, the, on 4096 cores, you can, you know, run eight 512-way jobs at the same time uh, within that uh, within that context. So this allows you to, you know, exceed the run limit by a factor of eight, essentially, uh, by by doing that. And the way you do that is you just run these in the background, and then with a Unix wait command at the end, wait for all of them to finish. This is a slightly more uh, programmatic. Uh, approach to that, that if you have rather than eight jobs, let's say you had many, many you know, thousands of jobs or whatever, in your shell script you would just say, well, do I have any of those thousands of jobs left to do? 
well, if I do and if I have nodes that are available, well, let's start the next one and then wait for one, one of the jobs to complete. So this is a way to set up your own queue within, within that patch queue. And that's the end. This is so the, the topics that we went over were sort of performance debugging and uh, dealing with jobs and dealing with, uh, with queue wait time. I'd be happy to take any questions that people have. Yeah. Actually, this is maybe it's a specific question. Um, in Linux, if I want to, suppose I have an application that has, let's say, 10, a thousand kernels, I'm methods, C++. Is there a, like a memory profiler, like a, akin to a runtime profiler that would tell me this function uses this much memory? Not aggregate, but or yeah. peak. Um, I always forget how to pronounce it, or I mispronounce it. Uh, Valgrind is uh, can do that. It will. Um, you know, we didn't talk about profiling malloc or um, those sorts of things. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So Valgrind is a is a, is a memory profiler, okay. and yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I may have missed it, but uh, I yeah. don't understand. Uh, I would like to know how you make these diagrams practically. Which tool you use to uh, see which uh, processor is communicating which with, with the, uh, which processor? Yeah, Craypat will do those, and IPM will as well. Um, I'd be happy to explain that more to you. Um, oh yeah, okay. There's a, another tool called Scholasca, which is a uh, uh, of German origin and very widely used at German computing centers that, uh, as you might imagine, these images, these maps become harder to make the larger computers get because you can end up with a 200,000 by 200,000 image. And uh, Scholastica can do some very massive images that way. But to my way of thinking, or the, the way that we use these is more like a postage stamp, which is to say, if I look at that image, not every 200,000 pixels, but if I look at that image, do I see the stencil that I expect in terms of the communication? Mm -hmm. Skolaska. Skolaska. Yeah. Skolaska. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, thank you. <laughs>